Okay, welcome to the Mastering Wholesale Revenue Masterclass. My name is Joe Evangelisti. I'm going to be your host for today's training entitled The Ten Commandments When Calling Sellers. This is a big one, guys, because if you're not well versed with what to do and say when you're on the phone with sellers, you can't put the deal together, right? This is the number one thing. It is absolutely necessary when it comes to putting deals together is figuring out how to talk to sellers, what to say to sellers, what the seller's engagement level looks like, how to overcome objections when dealing with sellers, how to say the right things so that maybe you don't have to overcome objections in the first place, right? So we're going to cover a lot of those things tonight on the class. If you're actually uh, watching live you're going to be coming on and you're going to be on mute. You're going to be able to um, type in your questions and I'll try to answer them as I do the presentation. There's going to be a couple live viewers on here with us um, as we go tonight. So without further ado, I'm going to hop right in it. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar um, so far, Basecamp REI. What is Basecamp REI? If you're watching this as a replay or if you're watching it live, Basecamp REI is the go-to resource online, private online community for real estate investors to commiserate, right? To learn, to grow, to interact, to share deal flow, to come together, commingle, and figure out how to all level up, right? We're all trying to ascend that mountain together. And so me and my team share knowledge, share deals, share joint venture opportunities, and all together, just share, just try to just try to create that abundance mindset, right? So if you're not familiar with Basecamp REI, um, and I will, by the way, if you're local to the South Jersey market, we are in Haddonfield, New Jersey. We also owe the, uh, have the added benefit of a co-working space as well for real estate investors. So not only are we an online community, which is doing a lot of, of training and um, advancement for real estate investors which you can get involved with online, but as well as you could get involved in person if you guys are local um, and you can actually physically rent space from us as well. So uh, that's a little bit about Basecamp. That's a little bit about our sponsor for tonight and for um, the training opportunity if you're watching the replay here. So check out BasecampREI.com for more information. So let's get into the 10 commandments when calling sellers and let's start working on ourselves, okay. So what does it look like, the Ten Commandments when calling sellers? Well, first and foremost, if we're dealing with calling sellers, I'm going to give you a little bit of the highlights, and then we're going to get into some, some interest in a little bit more detail. Number one, we want to remove the red lawnmowers. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what that looks like in a little bit. We want to use the power of SLE. I'm going to tell you what SLE means, how you can implement that into your practice. Oh, a little bit of housekeeping, by the way, before I get any further. Guys, if you're watching this and maybe the availability of the replay is there for you, maybe it's not, I'm not sure what platform you're gonna be watching it on, please make sure you grab a notepad and a pen, take some notes here. There's some things that I'm gonna cover. Um, for, for those of you that are really new in the space, this is gonna be a lot. It's gonna be like drinking through a fire hose, but I'm gonna give you a lot of information. For those of you that are experienced in the space, still gonna be some pretty high level stuff that we cover here and I'm positive that you're going to get some good takeaways that are going to help advance your business. I don't care if you're doing 5, 10, 15, 20 deals a month. There are things here that will help you amplify and multiply um, your conversion when on the phone with sellers as well. So, and again, if you've never done a deal before, this is also great for you as well. A lot of the reason, one of the reasons that I do these trainings is actually to train my oncoming acquisitions um, reps as well and in, in the art of talking to sellers. So back to it, no red lawnmowers, right? We're going to talk about the magic of SLE, what that means, how to use it. We're going to talk about learning our craft. Folks, if you're watching this, if you're a business owner, if you're on the phone, if you're a salesperson, if you're making calls, if you're talking to sellers in any way, shape, form, I don't care if you're a processor on a team, if you're a transaction coordinator, you're in sales somehow right? Every one of us is in sales. I make a joke about this all the time. I don't care if you're just trying to convince your wife what's for dinner. You're selling all the time. We are always selling. So you want to be good at life. You need to be good at sales. Bottom line. Okay. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about some sales techniques that not only will work on your wife, but will work on sellers as well. Okay. 
and knowing your avatar, right? Understanding your avatar, understanding what an avatar means, what it looks like, and how we're going to go after it. Um, seeking to help, right? You think it's a little bit self-explanatory, but we're going to get a little bit deeper into that as well. Um, no BS, right? Cutting out the BS, understanding how to cut BS out of your life and why the BS is so important. Asking better questions, right? What questions to ask, how to ask them, how to get deeper, how to figure out how to stay in the question mode. We're going to talk about that a little bit tonight. M&Ms and M, right? Figure out what that is in a little bit. We're going to get creative. We're going to understand the, the creative process behind what to do when we're on the phone with sellers. And last but not least, the platinum method that very, very few people use. You want to stay on for this entire call because that last one is a game changer for especially if you've never done deals before, this one's going to be one that's going to, this will catapult your sales career. If you have done deals, if you're on autopilot and you're doing a lot of deals, this will add percentages, 10, 20, 30% to your bottom line when we talk about this last method. So let's jump into it, right? No red lawnmowers. So I'll tell you guys a quick story. Sales coach taught me this a long time ago. If you're on the phone with somebody, we've all had this, this person call us, by the way, okay? So I want you to picture, I want you to envision for a second, you have, uh, you, you go on Craigslist and you see a red lawnmower, right? And the Craigslist ad says it's a Sears uh, Craftsman, five horsepower, red, 21 inch lawnmower. And the guy wants uh, $150 for it, right? So you call up that ad and you say, ring, ring, guy answers the phone and you say, is this the owner of the Sears Craftsman five horsepower, 21 inch red lawnmower for sale for $150, right? What does a person on the other end of that phone call sound, what does he, what does he think right off the bat, right? Well, he thinks, who is this psychopath calling me, right? Because what do most people do when they call somebody that's, that's more casual, that's not in sales, right? What do we normally do? We just call up and say, hey man, is this to do with the, with the, with the lawnmower? You got the lawnmower for sale? I'm calling you about the lawnmower. Yeah, is it still available? Yeah, okay, cool, boom, right? Right into the conversation, right? So we wanna skip the red lawnmower talk, right? How you start out the beginning of your conversation is 90% of the battle. The beginning of the convo, getting into the psyche of the seller, if you start out with, hey, this is Joe Evangelisti calling from South Jersey Wholesale Deals, LLC, located in Haddonfield, New Jersey. I was just calling about your house. You won't get to LLC before the phone gets slammed in your face, okay? So when you sound like a salesman, you will get slammed on, right? Try to sound casual, try to sound confident. Drop the LLC. Don't talk about your address. Don't talk about your company. Generally, depending on whether it's an inbound call or an outbound call or wherever we're trying to call back, generally I'll say, hey, I'm trying to reach Sally. Yeah, who's this? I'm uh, just returning your call. This is Joe. I was just returning your call. About what? Uh, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not sure you, 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 I saw a missed call on, on my business line. And I just wanted to reach out, reach out to you, or I got a voicemail from you regarding your properties. Do you have something you're interested in selling? You want to get them, guys. You want to get them into the third or fourth or fifth sentence before you get to why you're on the phone, right? Because if you if you if you have verbal diarrhea about everything that you're talking about within the first ten seconds, people naturally want to hang up. When somebody answers a phone and they don't understand the number that's calling them, they're on the defense. They're immediately defensive and they're looking for a reason to hang up on you. They're looking for a reason to say, this is a cold caller, I don't wanna to talk to this person, hang up, click, right? So get them into the second or third or fourth, I'm calling you back. Oh, you're calling me back from what? what did, when did I call you? Oh, you left them a voicemail. A voicemail about what? Now we're talking, now we're having it, we're engaging. By the time we get to the point that we're talking about why, we're already in a conversation, right? Be sorry. Be humble. 
be be on the be on the defense, not on the offense, right? Don't call the phone and be aggressive on the phone. Hey, I'm really really sorry to bother you. Just returning your call. I, you know, I, did I catch you at a bad time? So, you know, I'm sorry. Sorry if I caught you at a bad time. Be very apologetic. See what happens when you do it that way because you will see people's tonality shift. If someone says, oh, man, what are, you, what are you calling me for? Oh, my God, you know, I'm, I'm really, really sorry. I hate, hate to bother you right now, but I saw the missed call, and I just wanted to get back to you. You know, is there – do you by chance have a house for sale? I mean, I, I'm not sure. I'm just trying to – I'm trying to piece it all together, right? Be humble. People have a hard time bullying you when you start on that defensive approach, right? So what, do we drop the, what if we drop the call, right? I love this within the first couple sentences. Once we break the ice, once we get to the second or third or fourth sentence, yes, they have a house to sell. Great. You know what? I tell you what, it only takes me five or six minutes and a few questions to get through to be able to put together an offer for your house. Would that be okay? Yeah, that's not a problem. Okay, Sally, I tell you what, um, just in case we drop the call, is this the best number to reach you back on? It is. And, and is, 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 this, is this a good time to talk? Yeah, it is. Or, no, it's not really. You know, I'm a police officer. I work the second shift. I, I normally sleep between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m., right? So what does the drop call teach us? The drop call question. If, the, if we get disconnected, what's the best number to reach you? If we get disconnected, when's the best time to reach you? Those questions are not just housekeeping questions. When you, when you hear professional salespeople or professional cold callers have these questions, the reason you see them asked is because we're trying to build rapport. We're trying to understand the prospect. We're trying to understand more about them. These are digging questions. Not just, I, I care about the phone number to reach you on. By the way, sometimes people are going to say, no, this isn't my best number. You're calling my home number and my cell is really the best time to reach me, best place to reach me. Don't be surprised when people give you better contact info. Take notes on that. Update your, update your notes, right? All right, let's talk about the magic of SLE. What is SLE? Well, first of all, we want to understand our prospect, right? SLE. First of all, you have two ears and one mouth. God gave you those things for a reason. Now, I'm on this call right now, and I'm speaking the whole time because I'm educating. But for the most part, when I'm on the phone with the seller, I'm purposely asking questions, and then I'm pausing. And I'm listening, and I'm trying to figure out who is this person I'm on the phone with? What are they all about? Why do they want to sell? Where are they going next? What do their kids do? You know, where do their kids go to school? How old are they? What are they doing now with their time? Do they have a job? Do they need the money? Do they not need the money? Do they have problems they're dealing with? Is there some, some you know, extenuating circumstance we're trying to figure out so we can help them make a transition, right? Listen, listen, listen. So what is SLE? Number one is situation, right? I want to seek to understand their situation. I want to know all those things I just, I just said to you. My team will tell you this all the time. When they bring me a deal, if they say to me, Joe, we have a deal, it's over on XYZ Main Street, and it's a three bedroom, two bath, and the seller's willing to sell it for 150 grand. Great, what's the situation, right? Because so far you've told me nothing. So far, I don't care. I, there's houses all over the place. I'm looking out my window right now, there's houses up and down my block. I don't know any of my neighbor's situations right now. Well, that's a lie, I know a few of them, but some of the houses I'm looking at, I don't know anything about their situation, right? What is the situation that's going on in that particular house? Why are they moving? Where are they going? What do they need the money for? Do they need all the money? Do they have any other money saved up? How many people are, in, you know, is it a state sale? How many people are, are making the decisions? How many people are inheriting the money? Where's the money getting chopped up? Who else has their finger in the pot, right? all the situational components to the transaction. I want to ask these questions and figure out these answers to understand how I can bring real value to the situation. Location, number two. If you're in real estate, guys, this has been beat in your head for years. Location, location, location. You need to know the location because you need to know how to link it up with the right buyer for your deal if you're in wholesale. Now, you might be an investor as well. That's great. I'm an investor. I buy things. I wholesale them. I keep them. I hold them. I wholetail them. I do all kinds of different things with them. Location happens to be 
extremely important to us because there's deals that I don't want to hold on to. There's deals I don't want as a rental property. There's deals that I don't want to build on, right? So I want to know about that location. And I mean specifically, it might be in a great neighborhood, but is, is it next door to the railroad tracks? Is it across from a commercial building? Is it next door to a restaurant, right? What is the location of the property and is it desirable, right? Location also has to do with what is it adjacent to? Maybe there's the vacant land next door. Maybe there's some opportunities specific to the location that that piece of ground is important. And last but not least is equity. And we have many different ways to figure out equity when we're on the phone, which we'll talk about a different class, but you guys got to have some idea of equity. And we're going to talk about how to figure out a little bit of those things in the next couple slides. But you should know who you're talking to and you should know how much equity they have. You should at least ask the question so you have a baseline of what you're talking about. You can't help them out of their situation. You don't know how much equity you're working with. This is one of my favorite parts, right? And I hope you guys can see this because for some reason, it looks like my, uh, my little uh, thing up top. There you go. My thumbnail up top video is covered up, but I'm not even sure if you guys can see my little thumbnail there. So anyway, learn your craft. Sales 101, right? Put the coffee down. Coffee's for closers. Guys, sales is life. I've been in sales for a long, 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 long time. All the way back since when I was a teenager working as a server, right? Upselling, you know, you know appetizers and desserts and coffees, right? Understanding what the psyche was behind a client to help them want to, to, to purchase those things, to increase their check size so I could therefore increase my tip size, right? But all the while, bringing them great value along the way, believing in your product, loving what you do. Folks, if you're on the phone and you're talking to sellers, you better love what you do, but you also better learn how to sell so you can actually help them get out of that situation and create value for yourself and your team as well as the client, right? How do we do that? Well, we got to learn our craft. Oh, right now I'm getting, there we go. Number one, learn to answer questions with questions, right? One of the biggest things that I see people get hung up on is they get an objection, they start to stumble, and they, and they, and they go off course, right? One of the things that was taught to me years and years ago in, our sales, in one of my sales trainings was, Learn to say to people, hey, you know what? That's a great question. Let me ask you this, right? What you're doing is you're, you're, you're approving of their question. You're not answering it, but you're coming back and you're, you're, you're redirecting with a different question. 99 times out of 100, if this is done correctly, they're not even going to pay attention to the question they asked you. So, for example, let's say you said, uh, we're buying properties in your area or we, we've bought properties in your area. And they say, well, what properties have you bought? Well, that's a great question. I know that we've bought properties in your area. I'm actually just the sales guy. You know, I know my team's buying properties in your area. But let me ask you this. Is this something that you absolutely have to sell in the next 60 to 90 days? Right? That might not be the best example. But you see the idea, the direction. We always want to end with a question mark. We always want to give them something to do after the fact. You want to stay away from statements and you want to stay away from putting words in your client's mouth or your customer's mouth. You want to keep from telling and start asking, right? Repeat and approve. This is another one. When people say something along the lines of, um, you know, we would love to, to get to North Carolina, you know, relocate to North Carolina and sell the house. This is going to sound super silly to you if you don't have any sales training. If you've never done this before, it's going to sound silly. But when you're on the receiving end of this, I promise you, it sounds like second nature. Somebody says to you, we'd love to sell this house, get the proceeds and go buy something in North Carolina. You repeat back to them. I understand you'd love to sell the house and get the proceeds and move down to North Carolina. Let me ask you this, right? You've just repeated everything that they said basically word for word. You've approved of their statement and you move right into a question. 
right? So that's high level. I know I'm going a little bit fast. It's high level, but repeating and approving gets people to build rapport. That that's what gets people to under, to start to know you, or start to like you, and they start to trust you because you're speaking their language. You're you're starting to align with them. You're they're starting to to uh, to 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 feel like you're the right fit because you're you're repeating and approving of what they're having to say, right? Guys, this is a big one, right? Start to learn to pause and breathe and slow down, okay? I prospected for in, uh, in retail real estate sales for years and years and years. One of the tricks that I used to do all the time when I got into a sticky situation is I would say to people, Oh, I'm really sorry. Can you, can you just hold on one second? My computer's acting up. I want, to, I want to take the best notes here. I want to make sure I get the right notes. Or, you know, give yourself some room. Sometimes, guys, all you got to do is just pause. You would not believe, and I just did it, by the way. What was that, two seconds? You would not believe just the two-second pause doesn't even interrupt the conversation sometimes but it gives you a time to reset, take a breath, start to relax, and start to regain your thoughts, right? If the idea of selling gets you nervous, which it does for a lot of people, if asking the right questions gets you nervous, if an objection throws you off, go back to the pause. If somebody asks you a question in the form of an objection that throws you off, Repeat back, that's a great question, and then pause. Think about what to say next. Just the time it takes you to say, that's a great question, a lot of times gives you enough time and bandwidth to regain your thoughts and ask the next question. This is another biggie. Start to dig deep and help. Coming from a place that you physically want to help somebody instead of just trying to call them and take their money or figure out a way to put a deal together so you can win, right? This is a big piece of learning to serve a client that's in need or in distress or in some sort of situation and learning to actually help versus just pocket a paycheck is going to set you apart from other salespeople. Study, study, study sales, right? There are a ton of podcasts, there are a ton of books, there are a ton of YouTube videos, there are a ton of ways to learn how to study the psychology of sales. Some of my favorites are Tom Hopkins from way, way back in the day. You can grab some of his books, they're still relevant today. I've learned from Joe Stumpf, I've learned from Dean Graziosi, I've learned from hundreds of different um, top salespeople. And they were, they're not the salesy, salesy type that you might think. Some of them just study people. Some of them study, study reactions. Some of them study questions that are going to get people to think a little bit deeper. Just study the craft and have it constantly being played in the background when you're driving, when you're in the shower, when you're at the gym. Study the craft, right? And then practice. This is another one that people miss a lot, right? They get their ego in the way. They feel like, oh, I, know, I understand my script. I don't need to practice my script. You know, I know what I'm going to do. I'll, I'll, I'll practice with, with the people on the phone. That's going to give me enough engagement. Wrong, right? Learn to practice with other people that are on the phone in your office, right? Call each other. Test each other. Help each other grow, right? Practice and role play. Make perfect once you're handling objections live. Okay. Knowing your avatar. This is definitely the wrong photo for this slide. So excuse the, the donkey photo because this is not the right photo. Knowing your avatar, guys. Oh, there's the avatar. All right. So, and that's the right avatar, but that's not what an avatar is, okay? What list is being sent, right? So when you're on the phone with people, you should know who you're sending that target audience to, right? So we should know our avatar. Folks, your avatar, if you don't know what this terminology means, go and Google it after this presentation. The idea behind an avatar is knowing who your target audience is. So when you're on the phone with that person, maybe you sent direct mail out to a pre-foreclosure list 
So the people that you're talking to are generally going to have a higher stress level. They're generally going to be behind on payments. They might be people that you have to get more creative financing or subject to or something along those lines. So you have to understand who you're talking to. They're not going to be cash only or I'm sorry, um, high equity or free and clear sellers. They're in a different state of mind. So you have to know which list that's being sent out that you're talking to on the back end when the seller calls back in, right? What's the financial burden? Do they have a financial burden? Maybe you're talking to a probate list that just inherited property, right? Their, their challenges could be altogether different than the pre-foreclosure list that you send out direct mail to, right? What's the location? Where are they at? Maybe they're, maybe they're located differently from where the property is. A lot of times we're dealing with out-of-state owners. Maybe they're in Oregon and they own a property in New Jersey, right? So what's their location and what's the property location and the, and the difference between the two? Maybe you're dealing with an estate sale that has kids spread out all over the country and the property is local to you, right? What's the demographic? Again, what's the type of people we're talking to, right? What type of situation are they in? Understanding the prospect and understanding what their unique situation is, is going to help us. What's their overwhelming need? Again, I used the pre-foreclosure list as an example. Those people are getting hounded and pounded with credit inquiries and, and mail and late notices and foreclosure notices, right? And, and they're under pressure to do something. Whereas the flip side is maybe somebody on a non-owner occupant with, with, with high equity isn't getting any type of mail like that. Maybe they're just getting your, your common, I'm an investor, I want to buy your property type of thing. The conversation is going to be different. So speak to the conversation in front of you. Speak to the avatar of the list that you're talking to. Make sure you're directing the conversation and you're setting the tone for that particular person, right? Seek to help. We just talked about this a minute ago. Guys, if you go out there and you're, and you're, you're trying to make sense of a situation, you got to go at it with a, 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 a need and a want and integrity to want to help. You can't be Pinocchio man here, right? You can't be lying, cheating, and stealing. You want to actually have a clear conscience and you want to be able to help people, right? So how do we seek to help? No, seriously, seek to help, right? You did the marketing. You know who's calling. You should want to solve the issues, right? So learn to solve the issues. Here's the, here's the challenge, guys. When people are on the phone, this kind of ties into the right list, the right person, the right avatar. So when that person's coming on board, again, pre-foreclosure is a good example. If you have a lot of people in pre-foreclosure facing short sale, facing the loss of their house, you know they have minimum to no equity, you better be really good at subject to, creative financing, trying to figure, maybe you're a listing agent who's trying to get deals listed as a short sale, maybe you're good at negotiating short sales, you better be good in that particular solve for the issue. If not, learn how to solve that issue, right? Learn how to figure out how to educate yourself, how to solve those problems. If you're going to continue to run into the same problems, seek to help so that you're not being the bad guy when you're on the phone with these people and you're actually capable of solving their issues, right? And again, this goes along with the same thing. Quit the BS, right? Sellers understand when they're being lied to. Sellers understand when they're being bullshitted. I was just, this is a good example. I'll tell you guys a quick story. I was just on the phone this afternoon with a seller that I called because they had a multi-unit in this on the same street as one of the multi-units that I currently own. And I was following up with this seller who literally three days ago was just called by two people in my office, right? Now, this is kind of a good example of, uh, uh, of uh, no BS, right? And, you know, nobody in my office did the wrong thing, but the first person that called got all the information, but they didn't save their notes in the system, okay? And so a couple hours later on the same day, another one of our sales guys went on the system, saw the lead, thought it was new, called the same guy, and did the whole thing over again, right? Right? And now for the last three days, we have had a hard time following up. The guy's not answering his phone. The guy's not answering his phone. So I came back today from vacation and I said, well, I got to get a hold of this guy. He's got a great multi-unit and it's next door to one that I own. 
So I called him and I happened to get him on the phone and he answers the phone and I said, Hey, what's going on? And he said, I got to tell you, you know, two people called me from your office in the same day and they both asked me the same questions. I was pretty sure that you guys were full of shit and it must be some kind of scam, right? Guys, obviously this wasn't on purpose. Obviously both my guys didn't try to call this guy at the same time for no reason because they didn't have the same notes in front of them. But sellers can smell your bullshit. Sellers can smell if you're lying to them. Sellers can smell if you don't know what you're doing, right? So do the right thing. Don't lie about not knowing what you're doing. Don't lie about being productive in the business. Don't lie about having experience. Tell them the truth. When you call them, if you're an inexperienced wholesaler, tell them, I have a lot of buyers in your area. If you don't have a lot of buyers, start with the buyers. Go get some buyers. Call some investors. Figure out who's buying property in the area and then call the seller. If you don't have buyers yet and you're on the phone with the seller, tell them, I'm a marketer. I'm going to find somebody for your house. This is what I do. Let me figure out a good price for your property. Let's see if we can put a deal together. I tell you what, I'm going to call all the cash buyers in the area today. I'm going to figure out how to get the deal done and I'm going to circle back to you, right? Don't blow smoke up their ass because they will smell it. They will, they, they will taste it. They will understand it. And it will cause, first of all, it'll lead to poor decisions in the future. It's going to show off your lack of knowledge, right? They're going to know that you don't have the knowledge because they're going to, they're going to sense it on you, right? And here's the deal, guys. It always, always finds a way to catch up to you. So if you're doing this stuff, if you're doing this fake it till I make it approach, which by the way, there's good, there's pros and cons to that, right? It's not, it's okay to fake it and, and, and work hard and achieve it, right? Don't, don't lie about it though, right? You can say, I'm a wholesaler. You can say, this is what I'm trying to do. You can say, this is what I'm going to actively go do now. I'm going to find you a buyer. Just don't lie about it, right? Don't say I'm going to buy your property when I have no chance and no way to do it. Don't say I'm going to close in two weeks when there's no chance and no way to do it. Don't say you're a cash buyer when you're not a cash buyer, right? Tell the truth. No BS. This is another one. It's one of my favorite ones. I have this up on my wall in my office. Ask better questions, right? So you heard me talk about how we convert uh, their questions to questions, right? So we always want to ask questions. We want to leave with a question mark. So ask questions. Get deep. Help them understand that when they answer the questions that we ask, we're going to solve problems with them. So sometimes people will say, well, I'm not comfortable answering that. Well, here's the fact. You know, you're having a challenge moving to North Carolina. You're having a hard time selling your house. I know it's difficult to get through some of these questions, but the fact of the matter is, if I get the answers to them, it's gonna, I'm going to be that much closer to helping you be successful making this move to North Carolina, right? I need, to, I need to know these things so that I can help you put a deal together on your house. You know, how important is it that you sell this house to move to North Carolina? These are all deep questions. And then we get into the deeper things, right? About how much they owe on their property and, you know, if they're behind on their taxes, if they have any liens, if they had any judgments, if they try to list it for sale before, if they've had any other offers, right? These are all important parts of the situation. Let me ask you this. I love, love, love the lead in of let me ask you this. This is another one of those secret kind of sales hacks that allows me to think while I'm speaking, right? And if I'm in a conversation with somebody and, I, and it's conversationally going back and forth and I hear them saying something, and I know in the back of my mind, I want to ask a question. I might repeat, I might, I might kind of repeat and approve what they said by saying, um, you know, that's a great point, Mr. Seller. Let me ask, let me ask you this, right? Now that five seconds of that's a great point, Mr. Seller, let me ask you this, gives me enough breathing room and time to think of a deep question to get to the next level of the conversation, right? Gives me enough access to think for a second. So the let me ask you this is almost like doing a pause without actually taking a pause. Seriously care about people. This is another, you know, again, this gets back to helping people. This is a, I feel like this is lacking in the industry. I feel like we're, we're you know, we're, we're, we're hiring a lot of people. We're hiring a lot of VAs. 
Not that VAs don't care about people, but we're hiring a lot of people and not training them to actually care about helping people out of situations. We're just trying to put contracts, put deals together. Folks, when you learn to actually care about the people you're creating solutions for, you will make way more money. It will happen by virtue of you being a good person and putting the deals together and helping these people truly make their relocation to North Carolina a reality, right? Find the real answers. There's a lot of times when you're gonna get caught up by not asking the right questions and then you find out seven weeks later that, oh, this guy owes uh, you know, 10 times the amount of taxes than what his property's worth, right? When you could have just taken the time to ask the real questions and get the real answers up front. This is super important because again, this is another one of those things. How much you want for the property? Uh, you know, I want 65 grand. How about I send you a contract for 55? We call it a night. Okay, sounds good, right? And you skip all the deep shit. You skip all the situation. You skip all the hard questions. You skip all the finding out. What could be wrong with the property? How long have you owned it? Are there any liens and judgments? And then you find out that there's $90,000 owed on the property. And the whole team has spent the next three or four weeks getting through title, getting through inspections, getting through negotiations. And now we have buyers looking at the property. Then the title comes back and you find out they owe more than they could ever possibly sell it for, right? This simple 10 minute conversation will save all of that time, effort, blood, sweat, and tears. Get the real answers. Learn to listen and then listen some more. You heard at the beginning, right? Two ears and one mouth. So what are the M&Ms? The M&Ms and M, right? Well, mirror for number one, right? When we get on the phone with somebody, we wanna listen for the volume of their sound, right? We want to listen for where they're at and we want to match their volume. We want to mimic their character, their accent, right? Some people might have a twang. Some people might have a little bit of a lisp. Some people might have a little bit of a, of a, of a drawl, right? We want to mimic it slightly, right? And we want to match their tone and their speed, right? I tend to, I'm from Jersey, I tend to talk really fast right? Older folks, retired folks, sometimes you get on the phone and they have a hard time hearing you. It's not because of volume. Sometimes it is. Most of the time it's because of speed. I'm talking too fast. I have to bring it down to a level to mirror, mimic, and match the speed at which they talk. And I have to put my volume, my character, and my tone all in line with what they're doing, right? This helps people feel comfortable. This helps people start to build rapport faster. And this helps them connect with you. People naturally get upset when they're listening to somebody who's talking too fast and too loud and annoying and obsessive and they're asking questions and I don't wanna answer them and it's annoying, right? If they don't have the mirror mimic and match down, it starts to get annoying to some people. Now, what are some of the do's and don'ts here? Well, number one, you gotta keep it respectful, right? If someone has a, uh, an Asian accent and you're you know, like myself, I'm not saying to start taking on an Asian accent on the conversation, right? Maybe you, maybe you just put your tone and your speed and your volume at their level, right? But you're not gonna pick up an accent you never had before. You're just going to mimic slightly the character. You're going to get it in line with the volume of their voice, right? Study your prospect. How are their characters? How are their mannerisms on the phone, right? Are they pausing in between sentences? Are they, are they pausing in between certain variations of when they're talking. Can you mimic that? The more you can mimic the way that they speak, the more you're going to have a, a familial relationship with them. This is actually how cavemen would find a way to communicate tens of thousands of years ago. Just by their tone and their speed and the volume, 
of how they were able to communicate, they would know if they were in the right tribe or if they were talking to somebody who was in their tribe, right? It's no different today than it was then. Get creative. If not you, then who, right? This is one of the biggest challenges that I think I see a lot of people dealing with again. Because if you can't solve the issue, then who can solve the issue? Now remember, we're on the phone to help. One of the guys in my mastermind has this saying that he talked when he talks to sellers, the first sentence that he says to people when he knows that they're interested in selling, he will say to them, we're gonna do everything we can to help whether I buy the property or not, right? I think it's super impactful and succinct because he's wrapping it up in a tight little package. He's, first of all, there's some NLP in there, right? Some neuro linguistics processing. He's actually saying to them, I'm going to buy your property in that sentence, right? Or not, it's kind of a takeaway close. But he's also saying to them, I want to help, right? I'm going to help. I'm gonna offer you my help whether we buy the property or not. It takes people off their guard, right? It shows them you're here to help and you're, leaving with, you're leading with a service mindset. But if you can't solve the issue, if you get all the questions answered and you still can't figure out, what's your plan B, right? Be prepared based on your list. Again, are you dealing with an equity list? Now, a very short equity list. Is this something you can um, refer out to a realtor or is there a realtor on your team? Is this something you can refer out to an attorney to help negotiate? Is this somebody that's somebody on your list that you can help um, get a referral fee one way, one way or the other, right? Look to your power partners list. I teach entire trainings on how to deal with power partners. Your power partners are all the people that are resources within your sphere, right? Your insurance guys, your attorneys, your realtors, your cleanout crews, your electricians, all your subcontractors, everyone in your list are power partners. You should have two or three in every single industry. If you're on the phone with these people and you can't physically help them by buying their property, who can you refer them to that's either gonna help you create another referral or help you get some sort of monetary kickback in return, right? And last but not least, the 10X method that few use. This is gonna be the big piece, right? This is the platinum, the platinum method, right? Always, when you're on the phone with the seller, number one is this. Always do a two-part call, okay? When you're on the phone with the seller, get all of the information that you can up front, all of the information that you can, and even if you're ready to make an offer, at that point, you have all the information in front of you, your computer spits out a number and says, 100 grand is my bottom line, don't tell them 100 grand. Say to them, I tell you what, I, I, got all, I think I have all the information I need, I want to ask you a question. Are you going to be home for the next hour? Great. Do you mind if I call you back in 45 minutes, half an hour, 45 minutes? Perfect. I'm going to give you a call back. I'm going to do some research. I'm get my offer together. I'm going to talk to my partner. I'm going to, I'm, going to, I'm, going to, I'm going to get my best offer together. I'm going to give you a call back. Right? Then hang up knowing that you have all the information you need to put together a great offer and start calling your best clients. Start figuring out, am I on point here, right? If I know 100 grand is my MAO, is this an opportunity for me to do a deal with my best clients? Maybe you actually put the contract together first. Maybe you're a little bit more advanced, that's fine. But if you're newer to the business, start getting a hold of really good investors in the area that you have deals coming in and understand how to reverse engineer the deal, right? Get your buyer's what if price. Start to trust people. Sometimes I, I give them the address and tell them to drive by. Don't disturb the seller. Just tell me what you pay for this deal. Now, a little disclaimer. Do this with one or two people at a time. Don't send this out to 50 people if you don't have a contract. Because if you only send it to one or two people and then mysteriously the deal goes missing, well, then you don't trust those people anymore, right? But you should be able to build a good, good rapport with some A buyers that you know aren't gonna screw you out of a deal and you should be able to send them out there and have them do a drive-by. Someone drives by and says, you know what, that's a, that's a 110 deal all day long. Maybe you go back to the seller and say, look, good news, I get it done for 95 grand, sell in two weeks. Now you're confident. Now you know you got a deal on your hands, right? Because you've already got a buyer to drive by and that buyer is super hot and super interested because they know they're the only ones in on the deal. 
makes them twice as qualified as anyone else on your list because you treated them like a VIP. Don't be afraid to JV. This drives me nuts in the business, right? This is true JV, right? Not bird, I'm sorry, not, not daisy chain bullshit, but JV, right? If you have a deal and you can't get it sold, call a great dispositions team. If you're great at disp disposing of deals and you can't get deals under contract, call a great acquisitions team. Don't be afraid to split profits on a deal with a great team. We have done this time and time again where people bring us a deal and they tell us that they think they can make a three or four grand net. And then we make a $20,000 net and split the proceeds with them. And they still make $10,000, right? This happens time and time again, folks. Stop using your ego. Don't be afraid to joint venture with the right people. Say no today to your ego. Your ego is keeping you from doing more business. Stop worrying about I have to get the deal completely locked up and under contract. I can't JV with anybody. I can't call anybody. I don't want to tell anybody about how hot this deal is. I'm not saying go on, go on Facebook and blast a deal that you don't have under contract yet. I'm not saying call your local Rita and tell them all about what you just found but didn't put under contract yet. I'm talking learn to trust a handful of great people that have too much to lose by screwing you over, right? And then and, and stay in that circle. If you're in the Basecamp REI group, that's a perfect example of a tight-knit community of people that are not going to screw each other over. And if they do, they will be ejected post-haste, right? Reverse engineer the deal. Again, nobody does this, right? The reason I see people making $2,000, $3,000 deal assignments left and right all day long is because they do not reverse engineer the deal. Folks, all you have to do is create a gap in this business. If your buyer says it's worth 110, go back to your seller and get them down to 100. If your buyer says 110, say, get me to 113 and let's make a deal, right? If you have it at 108 at that time, all you got to do is get the seller to 105 or 103, right? Now, all of a sudden, you've made a $10,000 spread. Negotiate a little bit up, negotiate a little bit down and make yourself some real money. Stop closing deals for $2,000. The problem is you don't pay any attention to how much time, money, and effort you put in to putting that deal together. A lot of times you've made $2,000 and you actually broke even in real life, right? So call your best clients first, get them to give you a price. When in doubt, don't be afraid of JV. Kick your ego out the door, and always, always reverse engineer the deal. Fight to find a way. Last but not least, guys, fight to find a way. If you have a motivated, interested seller with a situation that needs to go, a location that's great, an equity to make a deal happen, you are already 50% of the way there. I see a lot of people giving up. See a lot of people walking away. Oh, the seller wants too much. The seller's being too difficult. Learn to negotiate, guys. Brush up on your sales skills. Dial it in. If your buyer is not coming up high enough, find another buyer. This market's on fire. When I'm doing this training right now, the stock market is starting to sink. There's still buyers out there. There's tons of buyers for these deals. If you have a great deal, use the stock market to your advantage. Call the seller back and tell them the sky is falling and you need to renegotiate, right? Find a way to put that deal together because by the time you've gotten to the point where you have a contract on a house, you are 50% of the way to getting paid. You've done the marketing. You've got the phone to ring. You negotiated. You looked at the deal. You probably inspected it and you've already got it out to your buyer's list. Forget about 50%. Maybe that number should be 80. You've already done all the work, folks. Stop walking away from deals that should be getting you paid. Payday is right around the corner. Ready to take your game to the next level? If you watched all the way through, this is your time. This is your chance. Find us by searching out Basecamp REI private Facebook group or send a DM now right to that private Facebook group or visit the BasecampREI.com website. Inside weekly live trainings, just like the one you're watching right now. Accountability, there's gonna be deal review inside. We have deal reviews each week. Access to private money. Our teams, processes, and systems. Probably the most powerful thing is my entire team is inside this portal, right? So when you guys have a question, you have me, 
you have my COO, you have my acquisitions guys, you have my dispositions, you have my marketing techs, you have my bookkeeper. I mean, everybody is inside this system. So when you have a question about how to build a high level wholesale team, you have direct access to them and you have your questions answered by the push of a button. Crazy, crazy good value. Make sure you go check it out at basecamprei.com. Appreciate you guys watching. I look forward to seeing you again on the next Mastering Wholesale Revenue Training.